What up, fam? Much love from the Gangster Preacher. Okay, so we're reading again my book from the streets to the throne by Isaiah Blancas, available on Amazon. And um, we're going to be reading chapters 11 and 12 this week. All right, so that's what we're going to be reading, fam. And um, I'm going to start. So chapter 11 is um, Death Wish. So most who knew me at that age said I had a death wish, which was kind of true. I didn't value my life at all. I started making even more money, eating where I wanted, bought the clothes I wanted, bought gold chains and watches. I partied as much as I wanted, and if sometimes I spent all my money, it didn't matter. I would just go steal some more and buy more drugs to sell and have more money anyways. So it didn't matter really to me, family of God. Um, it was, it was, I was very hurt in my life, but I learned to channel that hurt into hate and anger. That's one of the reasons that I didn't like school. I saw parents cheering their kids at sport events and just being involved in their lives. It made me furious. I would think of how my life would have been so different if I had my parents involved that way. I remember cutting my wrists, trying to commit suicide. I still have the, the scars on my wrist to this day. And uh, I still do on my, when, whenever I go preach places or stuff like that, they see them, I show them to them. I'm gonna stop there real quick because I thought it was important. Cause as you guys know, now I, I preach, I love God. And um, you know, they call me the gangster preacher, of course. But I feel it, um, this is the only part in the whole book until I get saved. I stop and talk about this um, because I thought it was very important. So I'm going to read to you what, what you know, I, I felt like God led me to say in my book and stop from all the craziness and it getting crazier and crazier until I found God. So this is what it says. Let me stop here for a moment and say to whoever is feeling suicidal as I did in my early age, You'll see through the story you're about to read that your life is going to get better. Don't give in or give up. Life might seem as if there's no hope, but trust me, there is hope. I hope that by reading my story, you'll be encouraged to not give in to a lie. There is so much more in life. Things will change and get better. There is always hope. I know you're feeling, I know what you're feeling and what you're going through. You have to keep keeping on. Sometimes in life, you just have to put one foot in front of the other until change comes and you'll see your life get better. You will not regret, regret living. Life has great things in store for you. Trust me when I tell you, there is hope in your future. Don't give in. More people love you than you think. Don't hurt yourself or others around you. When you're dealing with bullying, drug addiction or sickness or you're just plain depressed, there is hope ahead. Give life a chance because great things await you in your beautiful future. So that's where I stopped. And, and I'm just going to say that. I'm not, I'm not really saying that no more. But I wanted you guys to understand, you know, that, you know, I, I needed to stop there at this point and say something. Because, you know, I didn't want people or, or, or detention homes or people in prison or anyone getting this book and thinking, oh, it's cool, you know, kill yourself. You know, as a believer in Christ, we don't. We don't believe in that. We don't do that, right? So anyways, I'm going to keep going, fam. I was either high, out of my mind, on drugs, self-medicating myself, or I was miserable and angry at the world. I blamed, the, I blamed a lot of these feelings on my parents. The teachers, security guards, and principals started putting a lot of uh, their focus on me. They knew through student informants that I was one of the major drug dealers at school. It didn't help I hung around with other known gang members. I was always in trouble at the office for gang banging and being in fights against gangs. I considered to be my enemies. They were always checking me and patting me down for drugs. I knew I was on their radar. I would use creative and genius ways to make sure I never got caught with drugs on me. My Jackie's homeboys and I hid drugs in, in our projects in bricks or rock walls. We would loosen the bricks from the wall and hide drugs behind the brick. This was something I saw drug dealers do in the Segundo Barrio. They also had lookouts on each corner and yelled cops or whistled 
to warn the other dealers so no one would have drugs on them and get busted. I used that tactic with marijuana. I hid it outside of the school at places only I knew. For the Roche pills, I carried an extra big fat permanent marker around. And the kind of marker I'm talking about, fam, was it was like um, those, um, I guess, plastic ones that you could pop the cap off of. So after opening the marker, I would stick some tissue paper at the bottom. Uh, this is another thing. I'd, I would always make sure that the markers were brand new. And um, you'll see why. I'll keep going. At the bottom of the open marker, um, after I opened it, I would put the toilet paper at the bottom and push it as hard as I could, then put a little piece of plastic on top of the tissue paper so the ink from the marker wouldn't bleed through onto the pills. I would put them in, I would put them in, into the back onto the end of the marker and then I would stuff more toilet paper on top of the pills and then put the cap back on the end of the marker. That way even if you shook the marker, you could not hear anything because it was so compact in other words. That's what I would do. You just think it was a marker. Tagging and gang graffiti was a big thing in, in those days, in my days. A lot of teenagers carried markers around and all they would do if they caught you with one is take the marker away. I had many taken away and it hurt me every time because I lost money. But at least I wasn't getting busted for drugs and going to jail yet. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna start reading chapter 12 and this is called Growing the Gang. Okay, and remember family of God, stuff's gonna get a lot worse as I go through this. I left a lot of stuff out still. I couldn't put everything in here. But remember, I love God now. I preach now. And um, and I felt like I, I needed to write this to help people out there that, that feel the same. That feel lost. That feel that there's no hope. You know what I mean? Because there is hope. Later on in my book, I can't wait to get to it. You'll see that there's hope. So back in the Jackie's Projects, when I was around 15, we really started growing. There was a big gang named, named Diablo the DDT gang in South Central El Paso. A lot of them ended up moving to the Jackie's projects or area because their housing projects were being torn down by the city. The Diablo gang did not get along with our best known rivals on the west side. We made an alliance with them, with the, with the with Diablo gang. We let them hang out with us at Jackie's, uh, the Jackie's projects as long as they understood whose territory they were in. And, and, and also that they made sure that they respected it and absolutely no spray painting their gang or graffiti on our walls. A few of them actually grew up in Jackie, so we knew some of them since elementary school. One time my younger homeboys and a few my age came running up to me in the desert behind Jackie's where I was hanging out. They came to me saying, the guys from Diablo are here, they're in the limousine. I said, okay, so what's going on? You know, I was asking them. And, I, and you know, uh, it's crazy because a lot of these homeboys I'm talking about, they're dead. You know, a lot of them have, have, have been hung in prison or OD'd or, or got killed. Uh, one of the guys I'm talking about in this story, he got hung by, um, by his own brother. Because um, they, they decided to join different organized crime groups. So his own brother hung him in prison. You know, so it's kind of crazy. But... My homeboys made it seem like they had come to start trouble. So I asked them, who else is here in the hood? They said, no one's here. We think everyone's partying in Juarez. You know, my homeboys would always go to Juarez. We would always go, a lot of us. And um, I said, well, let's hit them up. I always made it a point to show the younger ones to control our area with an iron fist. A few weeks earlier, some of the younger homeboys came to the projects from a few blocks up, which, and it was our territory. They said they've been driving by a street we controlled and a known member from a rival gang started throwing gang signs at them. There were maybe six to seven of my younger homeboys in a blue pickup truck. And I said, let's, let's go back up there. I was infuriated that they didn't beat him up while driving up the street. I saw there was a bat in the back of the truck. When we got to the apartment where the rival gang member lived, I got down and knocked on his door. His parents were saying, please, He's not here, he's not home. I knew they were lying. So I started busting all the windows out, all their windows out with a bat, yelling for him to come out. Of course he never did. 
and his mom and dad and everyone else in the house was yelling scared. After busting all their windows and trying to kick their front door open, we got back to the Jackie's projects and I started going off on my little homies, telling them let it be known we control this area. We never let anyone disrespect us. Now, that was a big thing for me. And you know, I wanna say later on, I saw this dude, man, in the church. And um, and I wasn't saved, man. Um, my, 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 my grandfather made me go to church and I saw this dude there and we were gonna throw blows, man. He came up to me and he was like, hey, you did this. And I said, yeah, I did this and that. And I was going off and I was just started beating him in church. And um, later on, uh, like you're going to read him, uh, you know, I'm going to read to you in my story. Um, I ended up locked up with a family member of his. And he would go visit that family member and he would, his family member would tell him, what well, me? That was a nickname, you know, my nickname. He controls everything up in here. He's like, I don't know how you remember him, but this dude's the craziest dude up in here. And he's down, and he ain't known to be played with. And I remember I, 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 I would go sometimes when I had visitation rights, because um, a lot of times when I was locked up, I didn't. And I, I, I would stare him down, and he, he would turn around, he wouldn't look at me, you know? So that's, that's I ended up seeing that dude a few times. That's why they wanted me to go with them when the guys from Diablo came in the big white limo. But when I got there, there was no problem. My homeboy Junior came out of the limo and was all messed up saying, hey, que rollo, vero? And which means, what's up, you know, for you guys that don't know Spanish in gangster slang. Some of his older homeboys came out of the limo saying, hey, we're cool with Jackies. We respect your turf and mean no disrespect. So all was good. Junior and I started hanging around a lot. He would throw big parties at his apartment in the Jackies projects. And a few guys from Diablo gang would be there but really it was jam-packed with Jackie's homeboys and homegirls our age. Junior and I knew each other since elementary. He was probably just a few years older than me. So we were cool. Junior started hanging around with us so much, I guess he figured he might as well be part of our gang. And since their projects had been torn down, they were always kicking it with us. Anyways, really. One night after partying at Junior's house, it was just me and him there talking, getting high and drunk. And he said, hey, where do I wanna be part of the Jackie's gang? And I said, okay. Tomorrow we'll jump you in. At this time, there were a lot more guys our age in the gang. So he wanted to be jumped in with a few others our age. I agreed, but I lied. I told some old schoolers, hey, Junior wants to get jumped in. I figured I got jumped in no different. Why shouldn't he? So the next day, me, Cruz, and our older homeboy, Chewy, jumped Junior in. We were beating him up for a while. I mean, oh, a good while, too. And uh, the only reason we stopped is because Chewy body slammed him on a parked car in Jackie's and the, and the alarm turned on and the car alarm went off. And I remember we, nicked, um, we nicknamed um, Junior Indio. He couldn't walk for three days from the beating he received. I knew we would grow stronger and that the rest of the guys from the Diablo gang that hung around Jackie's would soon follow Indio's footsteps and join our gang. Indio was looked up to by them and they all did get into Jackie's except one of them. But he would still hang around with us. We were growing and becoming more powerful. And the guys who we got into Jackie's from the Diablo gang were just as down as crazy and, and crazy as we were. I couldn't be happier. And, um, you know, it's crazy thing, you know, to think, you know, just to remember this because it's, it's in my mind. It's fresh. It's like yesterday. But um, that was my life. You know what I mean? I'm just giving you guys the, the, the real raw truth. And, um, you know, some of it. Because it's not, you know, I couldn't put everything in here. So, um, we grew up, we grew so much that we were filling Indio's four-story apartment with more people our age, you know, in the Jackie's projects. Our parties were better than the old schoolers' parties now. Sometimes older guys would come over wanting to party with us and all the girls we had. They would come over and knock on Indio's door and window, wanting to come in, and we would look through the window and laugh at them. Boy, would they get mad. Man, I can tell you, it's pretty funny because looking back at it, you know, we had got beat up so much by them, you know, that they had hardened, they had hardened us. I mean, they, they were molding us into street soldiers is what they were doing since we were little kids. So we... You know, we didn't care no more. So I, I, I could still picture their faces, you know, uh, a lot of the old scores coming over, knocking on the, 
the window and we'd be throwing them, you know, fingers and stuff like that and making fun of them and mocking them and laughing at them, you know. <laughs> so, it's pretty funny, you know, when you think about it. My wife always tells me, man, you, you have horrible stories, like you think some stuff's funny, but, you know, I, I never I never had nothing good in my life growing up, man. So I didn't have, I don't have good stories to tell. You know, now in God I do, but back then I didn't, you know, so we thought stuff like that, you know, was funny, you know what I mean? So they, they, they would start cussing at us and tell us they were going to beat us up. We would laugh at them. We really didn't care if they beat us up. We were used to it. The difference between our parties and theirs was that ours were loud. Everyone enjoyed themselves. We had loud music, either oldies or gangster rap. And theirs were quiet. Everyone all serious because they had all pretty much been to prison. And you know, I'm going to show you how they would do. And I'm just going to hold it here. But you know they would they would cross their legs you know like this, or they would put their leg like that and hold their legs like this and just sit there like this the whole time with their heads lifted up, totally quiet. They didn't want no noise up in their parties. It, it was crazy, right? They were institutionalized, you know, which later on I, you know I was gonna be too. But as a matter of fact, if you talked too much or made too much noise or wanted to blast the radio, you would likely get beaten up. So we didn't want them messing up our parties or have to go by their stupid prison rules. At least that's how we thought back then. I remember not seeing my homeboy Tiny at the party so much anymore. We found out he, at 11 years old, had gotten his 14-year-old girl pregnant. You know, this, I'm telling you, man, this is, this is this crazy stuff, right? Like, even when I was um, writing this book, um, I was just like, man, like, it just gets worse and worse and worse. You know, but... Even my homeboy getting a, you know, a, a girl pregnant at that young age, I mean, it was just like, it was crazy to us, you know what I mean? We're like, and I say it here too, it was a trip. When Tiny's baby was born, me and my homeboys would be walking by his apartment and see him out there with his girlfriend and a stroller and a newborn baby in it. I'm telling you, which we tripped out. I mean, he's 12 years old now. I mean, imagine this, you know what I mean? The projects, gangsters everywhere, you see syringe needles, needles all over the place, spray paint on the walls, gangsters all over the place. And here, here's my, my little homeboy, you know what I mean? With a stroller and a girl and a baby in it. We were like, we were like this is crazy. You know, so it was tripped out. And um, we would be on our way to still party. And um, to me, he looked hilarious, just like I was, you know, explaining to you guys. Um, Tiny would be there dressed in his dickies, muscle shirt, and Nike Cortez shoes. He shaved his head totally bald and left a long ponytail on the back, back of his head. Now, back in those days, a lot of homeboys, you know, a lot of homies back, back in the days here in Chuco Town in El Paso, where I'm from, all their, their whole head would be bald and they would have a ponytail like in the middle here that would go down. That was considered like a gangster thing, you know what I mean? So Tiny was my younger homeboy and I was one of the ones that schooled him in our ways. I made fun of him and gave him hell because of his situation. Tiny was always down and ready to roll with us wherever we went. But his girlfriend would tell him, stay with me and your baby don't go hang out with your friends. So on purpose, we would force him to go with us and harass him until he did. I can remember his girlfriend with a sad look on her face when we would take Tiny with us. But we didn't care. We didn't know any better. Back on the east side at my grandma's house, my sister showed up with all her belongings. I found out that she wasn't getting along with my mom. I guess after I was gone, my mom started taking out her anger on, on my baby sister, on my little sister, and ended up kicking her out. So she started hanging around with me and my east side homeboys. I was very protective of my baby sister. I would kind of take care of her like um, I was her father, and, uh, you know, to her. And so all my homeboys, I always respected her and took care of her as well. You know, because I was crazy, you know, I would, I would stab you. If you messed with my, 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 my baby sister or something like that, you, you're going to get hurt. People knew. You know, people that knew me. So they respected her. My homeboys from Jackie started coming to the east side and visiting me at my grandma's mobile home. I remember when they first started coming over, they would trip out and tell me, Hey, Wedo, this looks like it's our turf. The reason they said this is because all around the east side, in that area where, I, where my grandma lived, you would see... Big old spray painted block letters that were all colored in with spray paint and lots and lots of walls all over saying Jackie's or PBJ Westside Locos Wedo. The gang I fought with in the east side would also have spray paint all over the walls as it was their territory. You could see their gang spray paintings crossed out with a big X. 
then my graffiti right next to theirs showing I was the one who did it. That's a sign of disrespect in gang culture. You know, for all you people that don't know out there, I'm kind of breaking it down. You know, I, I broke it down in my book so people could understand. And it usually meant either if we were crossing each other out on walls, there would be problems if we ran into each other. But I just didn't care. I was wild, out of, con out of control. I laughed and told my homeboys, this is our turf. Then they laughed and said it looked like our turf. You know, the, the funny thing is, is I actually did start a, a chapter of my gang on the east side. I had east side homeboys that were throwing my, you know, west side gang. You know, so it was pretty crazy. By then, I always carried a knife or a big screwdriver, like 10 inches to 12. I'll probably say like 10 inches to 12 inches long to stab anyone who wanted problems with me or my gang. My friends tripped out on me, but they themselves were just as crazy. This one particular time, Baldo, Indio, Cruz, Tiny, and Conejo were driving a brand new Jeep and they pulled up to my grandma's mobile home. I was outside doing a drug deal and they rolled up and yelled out the window, what's up, güero? And I went to a Jeep, you know, and I, and I was like, I had my, 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 my arms like on their window like that, like I was kneeled, I was kind of knelt down, you know, in their, in their window. And um, I went up to her Jeep window and saw my homeboys inside. I said exactly what I was thinking. Where'd you steal this Jeep from? Waldo said, I didn't steal it. I bought it cash. I, I remember laughing, saying, yeah, right. And Waldo pulled the keys out of the ignition and wiggled the keys in my face. And he literally went like that with the brand new keys, you know, because he had this brand new Jeep of the year. And uh, my next question was, how'd you buy it? My homeboy Indio, held up kilos of marijuana and cocaine saying, get in, let's go party. I was with a, an ex-girlfriend of mine and I said, all right, let me go tell this chick, I'm jamming out with you guys, you know, let me go tell this Ruka, I'm saying bye. Uh, she made a big deal about it, I remember, uh, me leaving, so I told them to turn their Jeep around towards the street so we could leave. I told the girl, I'm gonna go tell my, my friends that I can't go because this girl started hugging on me, not wanting to let me go. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll be right back. I walked up to the Jeep and I told my homeboys to open the door, you know what I mean? And so they slung the door open. And when they did, I jumped in and closed the door. The girl chased the Jeep yelling cuss words at me. Yeah, it was funny, you know what I mean? And Valdo put the pedal to the metal as we all laughed at her. Man, we partied hard. We ended up at um, some different, um, we ended up with some different girls at some projects in the northeast side of El Paso where my uncles were from. And they pulled out a big bag of, uh, I mean, a big wad of money. Before we arrived, we made a beer run. We all got out of a corner convenience store and all of us grabbed two 18 packs of Budweiser beer. After that, we headed to an apartment on the northeast side ready to party. Even though we all had money, we were underage and, and legally not able to buy beer. But we would have stolen it anyway. I mean, even if we were of age, that's, it's just the way we lived. So at that apartment, Indio gave me cocaine nonstop for three days. We partied so hard, I didn't get back home to my grandma's for a week. Boy, were we crazy. So that's, a, that's the last chapter for this week, Family of God. Again, um, my book is From the Streets to the Throne by Isaiah Blancas. It's available on Amazon. You see the shirt I have on, a white From the Streets uh, to the Throne shirt. You can see my beanie. It's a black one that says From the Streets to the Throne on it. And um, so... If you guys are interested in getting my book, go get it through Amazon. Uh, if you guys like the gear that you see, I'm always wearing something different, trying to show you something new. Go to my website. It's uh, www.gangsterpreacher.com. And, um, and there's a, a merch thing there. Then it also has my email on there. You could email me and let me know if you'd like to get some stuff. And um, if you like this video, click like. And of course, subscribe to my YouTube channel, show some love, and um, and again, you, you already know if you're on here or if you're watching, it's on my YouTube channel is Gangster Preacher. And so much love fam, God bless you guys, and um, I'll see you next week.